Okay, so today on the Live On Form podcast, we are joined by Jamie Hunt. Jamie, how are you? Good, thank you. Very good, Phil. Excellent. So just a little bit of history. So you're a former professional triathlete transitioning to the world of kind of high performance sports apparel uh, and co-founded the hugely successful uh, Two Times You, which I've always called 2XU, so I apologize for that. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> yep. In a, um, they it's in my whole whole life in sports, whether it be apparel or being an athlete. So I'm, I'm very fortunate. So, so the, the, the brand name itself, I know, means multiply of performance, which is essentially what, what it was all about. And, uh, and taking the, the, the science of compression garments, essentially, right? And, yeah. and it's, it's a hugely kind of gray area. And, and we'll dig into that as we go into the podcast. Uh, but really, I wanted first to talk about kind of you and your background of performance. Obviously, you've got a massive history of performance and, and it's always been a part of your life. And how that transitioned from sort of sport to business to home life to to everything you've done really. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, I've I've always um been someone who has always had that driven personality. And, you know, you know, right from being a a six-year-old boy getting out of bed at at five thirty in the morning and going for like a seven or eight K run. Um, I don't know why I did it. I just did it. Um, you know, so um I've I've always always loved competing, always been really driven. Um, my mother was very much the same way. And they all say I'm very much like my mum, you know, but, you know, always been driven in sport. And then obviously when I retired from being an athlete, I went into business. I applied exactly the same match. So I wanted to be the best in the world at whatever I did. And um, so I went from being an athlete into business, into making textiles, um, you know, and just, just keep always wanting to be the best at whatever I do. So it's been a lifelong kind of like goal of mine. Cool. So, so let's just dig into that kind of performance history with respect to sports and things like that. You, you were saying as a, as a, as a, a six year old, you were, you were out running, running and uh, quite, quite large distances for somebody probably with a yeah. short stride length, but, uh, but obviously that's carried over and, and you become hugely successful in triathlons, uh, mm-hmm. you know, running, cycling, swimming, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, Let's just go back and have a look at that history of, of, of sport because, again, you competed at a pretty high level, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I mean, I, I started off um, started off doing triathlons, and and uh, I, I'm from New Zealand, and and New Zealand back in the mid mid eighties, triathlon was actually it was a massive sport. I think it was probably the leading sport in New Zealand. We had a couple of world champions, and Aaron Baker and Rick, Rick Wells, and and I remember my first triathlon. I was I think I was 13 years old. It was a sprint distance triathlon. There was 550. It was the Auckland schoolboy, the Auckland school champs. We had 550 competitors, which is unreal. Wow. You know, it was huge. Um, and um, and so, and I think I finished like 20, 20 to last. I finished almost last on that race. But pretty much within within a year, I um, I was doing pretty well. I mean, I, I grew up in a really uh, a poorer part of of um of Auckland where I grew up and my mother was always worried about me joining gangs and so she got me into running and swimming at a really young age so by the time I was seven or eight I was swimming by the time I was six I was, I was New Zealand sprint champion for running and I was going up to the middle distance as well um and then um yeah so basically I started doing triathlons when I was 13 14 by the age of 16 I was one of the best um New Zealand schoolboys. and what was interesting back in those days is that um I, I can i can remember i think the schoolboy champs i finished second in the top five competitors in that race ended up being world champions or olympic champions i mean like we we had this amazing era of of um of these mid to late 80 athletes out of new zealand that that were absolutely probably the best generation of triathletes ever in the history of the sport to come out of one city of auckland we had hamish Carter, olympic champion we had Paul Amy world champion we had I mean I won a few world titles we had Cameron Brown still at 50 years old still racing as a pro triathlete second in Hawaii Ironman twice we had multiple amazing athletes all in the same year at school it was just amazing so you know we um to came through in a really big breed when I was when I was 18 and 19 um I won the world junior duathlon championships um which um duathlons were quite big in those days particularly in Europe where there wasn't swimming wasn't really a big thing particularly in Europe so 
and then um, raced professional dual athlete for two or three years. And then when I was 24, um, I, I switched um, to do triathlons again. And in my first race back, I actually won, won a big race in Hong Kong, went to long course world champs, got fourth there behind, the, behind three ex-world champions. And I was right with them. Uh, four weeks later, um, I raced my first World Cup was winning until the last K and then got caught by Miles Stewart in the last K and finished second and bet the bet would be the future Olympic champion. Um, and then over the next four or five years, I was ranked as highest third in the world for a few years um, in ITU World Cup racing. Uh, obviously, the main goal was the Olympic Games. And when the Olympic Games came along in 2020, um, there was four Kiwis who were in the top 10 in the world. And unfortunately, only three got to go. And through some controversial agreements, they, they left me out of the team. Um, so that for me, by that stage, I was already married, had my third child was on the way. Um, so in, in 2000, 20, 20, 20, 2001, yeah, uh, I, um, I decided it was time to go and get a real job. So um, yeah, so you know, <laughs> loved, loved it, um, you know, saw the world, met a lot of great people, still contacts today that I use in business. Um, you know, have uh, uh, been great, and I just grew up, you know, living an amazing life. And and um and then obviously, at, when on the, at the age of twenty nine, I went out and, and got a real got a real job. So <laughs> <laughs> sounds like the sort of thing a parent would say. When are you going to get a real job instead of just <laughs> running and cycling and swimming exactly. everywhere? Exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, exactly. you know, that's a hell of a a sort of background in sport just to 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 start a brand or to start anything really. And obviously it's a very niche, niche sport in many respects, because it's certainly back then, uh, we didn't do triathlons, you know, over here, I, I you know, I was at school in the eighties and, and we did cross country and that was about as far as it stretched. And, and obviously there you mentioned school championships. So I'm guessing this was, it, it was actively pursued in schools. Yeah. Yeah. I'll completely. I mean, we, we had, um, we had regional champs, national champs. We, um, you know, the triathlon, the sport of triathlon, there was a lady called Erin Baker who won Hawaii three or four times. Yeah. Rick yeah. Wells, who won the first Commonwealth Games in 1990, which I also, also competed in. Um, you know, they, um, they basically led the light. And I think New Zealand always gravitated towards sports that they could be the best in the world at. You know, we obviously, you know, we love our, we love our rugby because we're the best in the world at it. And we love our cricket because we're probably the best in the world at the moment as well. But sports that we can be the best in the world at, we gravitate towards. And things like running and swimming, while they were big sports, triathlon was a sport where New Zealanders, even back in the 80s, were standing out. So kids would just jump into those sports. And so, you know, and we grew up in New Zealand around the ocean. I think, you know, I mean, I've got, you know, everywhere in New Zealand, there's an ocean within kilometers away, you know. Yeah. Um, we, we grew up running, you know, we obviously were the home of, some of the world's greatest runners from Arthur Liddy, he started the endurance running movement, the Peter Snells, the John Walkers, Rod Dixons of the world, Alison Rose. We had some amazing athletes in those days too. So look, triathlon was just like an ev evolutionary thing in New Zealand where we could all swim and run and, and biking was the easiest part to pick up. And we just kind of captured our heart really early. And, uh, you know, and I think, you know, um, even at the first Olympic games, the New Zealand men's team, points wise was the highest ranked nation in the world for men i mean like this is a country of four million people i mean you know we were we were dominated in the sport you know so it it just we just had this amazing era and um right from the school level we started there's a big thing called the wheat Bix triathlon series and and, it, and it, it actually is the world's largest um children's event is the new zealand triathlon wheat Bix triathlon series every kid in new zealand before the ages of 12 would, would do a mini triathlon. It's just really big, you know? So hence why triathlon our nation was big, particularly no, nowadays, most people have caught up, you know, we're not as big, we're not yeah. as good as we used to be. Um, but back in those days, it was a really important part of, I think most people in England, you ask, do you know what a triathlon is? Most would say, maybe, maybe <laughs> isn't it some guy called Brownlee who does it maybe, but in New Zealand back in the eighties, it'd be like, oh, of course you mean no triathlon. Are you an idiot? Um, yeah, so that was 30, 30 years ago, 40 years ago almost, you know. So, um, yeah, so a great a great place to, to learn how to do the sport and a, a lot of good people around as well. So, I'm, pr I'm probably bet better weather and better climate for it, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, as um, you know, for your listeners, there, I've, I've been living now in London for six months. This is my first winter here, and um, and it's tough. It's really tough. Um, the grey skies, um, the cold weather. No, no, Auckland on a whole is fantastic. And even from for us, even as a 16, 17 year old, you know, we would go across the Gold Coast and do training camps over there in our winter time, and it was twenty degrees, and so it was really easy to escape. So. No, the weather was a lot easier to be a triathlete. Um, swimming pools were everywhere. I mean, here in London, to try and find a pool to do laps in, yeah, yeah. next to right. next to blooming impossible. Um, so over there, you know, there's a local swim pool, swim squad, masters swim squad, on every on, on every suburb. Where here in the UK, I, I got to drive 20, 30 minutes to get to the nearest pool where I can actually do laps without getting told off for swimming over somebody you know so yeah and yeah much 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 easier to do it to be, to be an athlete in New Zealand than in, than in the UK for sure and I think most of the pools in the UK are, are, are far from Olympic distance aren't they they're all they're all about 15 meters long I think yeah they, they, they are they are they are pretty short I actually have, I actually have found a fantastic um swimming pool which took me a while to find but it's in uh, in Kensington here in London and it's and if you go after nine o'clock I almost get a you must get a lane to myself which is pretty amazing That's so I'm pretty excited about that pool. So much so, I'm looking to buy a house, and I've managed to convince the wife that a house house needs to be very close to the swimming pool. So um, <laughs> it's working out well. This necessities, right? Necessities. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Cool. So, so you're obviously still you're still doing triathlons, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, I um, um since I retired, I probably had ten years off, then came back when I was when I was forty. Um, did did a sub nine hour Ironman when I was forty, which is nine years ago now. Um, and my goal, and my goal next year is to go sub nine as a 50 year old. So, um, I did a 902, I did a 902 Ironman two years ago in New Zealand, which is quite a hard course. Um, so I'd love to go to go sub nine here in Europe. There's a lot faster courses. So I think sub nine is definitely on the cards, uh, for this year. So, um, yeah, so look, still, still enjoy it. Um, you know, luckily I've got good staff. I mean, I probably only work four or five hours a day, so I get a chance to, to get out and do some good training when the weather's not so not so bad so yeah so, cool. so, so still still love it um still do it i can ne- i can never stop um it's part of who i am i know for my own mental health it plays a really important part um and it's just inbred in me from, from when i was five six years old and it's a really important thing for me to do for myself so cool so so there's this performance mentality and and let's talk a little bit about uh, two times you, I keep, keep going to call it 2XU because I've known it as that for my entire life and nobody's ever corrected me. It's a bit like yeah. our brand. It's, uh, you know, it's how, to, how do you pronounce it? Is it human 24? Is it HMN 24? Is it, <laughs> it, it, we, we have that similar dilemma. So you, you built that from a startup to, to, to where it got to yeah. uh, in, in sub 10 years, which, you know, for the, the business oriented people, that's, that's, that's incredible to build a, a brand that is, is as big as it got. And yeah. Uh, you you sold to more Hennessy Louis Vuitton for the people that, that yeah. know uh, LVMH they're known as uh, which is yeah. massive I think they have about seventy five hundred brands or something like that yeah, uh, yeah. under their yeah. umbrella yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and sportswear probably isn't isn't their thing uh, as no. much as kind of high fashion stuff so so again a, a, a multitude of things there which are, are pretty incredible yeah. so. So tell us about two times you and and you know where that came from, where the the sure. sort of first thought process occurred, and and, yeah. and why you wanted to develop that. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, first of all, I mean, like when I stopped, when I stopped being an athlete. Um, luckily for me, my um, my best friend owned a, a triathlon brand called Orca, and so I spent spent three and a half years um, at Orca, and that was and that that was that was really my my apprenticeship in some ways. It was my you know I basically went in. I had, I did, I did economics while I was racing. Um, I said to my wife, I don't want to stop being an athlete and have nothing. So I actually did economics at university extramurally while I was racing, which was great to do. And so when I, when I stopped being an athlete, I went into the accounts team at Orca. Lasted, lasted six weeks in there because I hated doing bank reconciliations. And then luckily for me, the head product person got up and left one day and I said to the owner of Orca, look, I know nothing about fabrics, but I know exactly what the athletes want. So he goes, okay, you're my man, hop in an aeroplane, go to Italy and do a range. And so I went to Italy, spent, spent 10 weeks in Italy, created, a, created the next Orca collection, sold three times more than, than it had the previous year. So I found my, my new love and that was fabrics and building amazing products. And so after three and a half years there, and 
I was running the company after basically after a year of being there. Uh, this guy in Australia came to me and said, "Hey, look, there's no real great Australian sporting brands. Would love you to come. You know, I'll give I'll give you the money. Come and and grow this brand." So he gave me a million dollars, which which is not a lot, um, but it's not it's okay to get started with. So when uh, when I went across there, went across to Australia, um, started. Um, um, right from the start, I said to this guy, look, I'm happy to do a sports brand, but it has to be an elite sports brand. So I do not want to make cotton poly t-shirts. It's got to be <laughs> high-end performance. Right, suits and... <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, sports in the UK, I get absolutely amazed. I mean, people just call sportswear, you know... Um, yeah, anything that's a cotton and, poly and mix is sportswear. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I would, I mean I, I'd mean, i even question a brand like... like, like like Gymshark being sports, maybe I'm a bit too elite, but but I mean, I, I I want it to be this elite, elite level brand to start with and just build the yep. best fabrics possible, use the latest techniques and fabrics and manufacturing and this kind of stuff. And he goes completely on board. And and that really was, that really was the, um really was our thing that took, took us to the top, you know, in those first three or four years. We started off doing triathlon clothing year one, but we, we did a triathlon run cycle compression was just kind of coming onto the scene at that stage so we kind of dabbled with it in the year but but after year after year two we were the world's biggest triathlon brand even though we weren't really trying to be a triathlon brand so we'd already be already already bigger than Orca, the last company i was at um compression in australia was starting to take off because it was the home of compression clothing um by year five or six we were starting to get quite a good chunk in the u.s market we had about a couple hundred stores in there selling our compression, about a hundred doing our triathlon clothing. Um, and then I think probably by year eight or nine, you know, we were, we were up to 25, 30 million in profit, you know, well over a hundred million in sales. We we're a very profitable business. And it was just, it was just, it was just this massive ride of growth, um, you know, and it was built off just being different. Like the language we spoke, we spoke about yarns and fibers and technology and, Little Lily Lemon would talk about this garment's got silver in it, it wicks moisture, but we would go to the next level and say it wicks moisture because of A, B, C, D, and here's how we do it differently. Yeah. So we we really went to the next level and became the real educators in sportswear. Um, and I know we'll come come to Prezio in a minute, but Prezio is again it's another another layer to that. You know when you know when we when I started Prezio, but that back in those days, you know we would go to the nth degree to talk about performance yarns and fibers and we got so many believers on board i mean people just just wanted to be involved and you know we you know um you know at our height we had every nba team wearing our compression we had lebron james wearing it non-stop even though he's, he was nike's biggest athlete you know he's multiple magazines him wearing our gear 24 7 i even saw him wearing two times you even a few weeks ago to be honest um, um but um but you know we had all these believers because we we did our science like we spent five million dollars in compression research you know we i i you know i am probably today one of the most well-respected fabric engineers in sportswear so we i would always be trolling new fibers new yarns how to denigrate technologies and no one in the world is doing this. I mean, even the top dogs like Nike, they just do a really simple blend of fibers. Like, you know, so we were just doing, you know, world's lightest run tops, best moisture wicking, best thermoregulating, regulating, best compression, most power. We were just, we were just really changing the landscape um, of sportswear. And, and those who took time to listen to us just, just jumped on board and we had this amazing growth. And I, you know, I think, um, so about, probably about seven or eight years ago now we um lvmh came in and you know um and they and they bought into the brand and you know we sold off a minority shareholding but part of the deal was is that they'd bring in a ceo you know i, I was a fabric guy I wasn't i wasn't a ceo you know because you know these big guys know what ceo should look like and i wasn't that no you know, i was a fabric geek you know um um, but they bought a Sky guy in from Adidas, and it, it, that really was the change of the brand. I mean, I'm not saying it's not a great brand; it's still a really good brand. But they kind of drifted away from high performance and went more into lifestyle. And that was the one thing that I never wanted to happen. And it's the reason why I sold up three years ago um, was because it just it was going away from what I wanted my brand to be, and that was a world leader in fabric technology. And and again, two times you. Still, still using some great fabrics that were developed a while ago now, but still, a, still a solid brand. Um, still, probably would be the best compression brand 
with the exception of of my new brand. Um, but um, but uh, but yeah, look, and 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 ultimately, you know, I you know, it was a great journey. I learned so much. Um, um, had great partners on board al along the way. Um, you know, had le learned a lot, but I also learned what I what I didn't want to have for my next brand. Um, so it's a great great lesson. Did really really well. Made enough money that I can now live comfortably uh, the rest of my life. Um, not that it matters because you know I'm still only I'm still in my 40s, and so I still you know I still have a lot more left in me. You know, um, yeah. So that was kind of like the two times you journey in a very very condensed way. I could probably spend hours telling lots of stories about it. Um, but it was it was a it was an interesting journey. Learned a lot. Far, fastest growing company in Australia for two years in a row um you know traveled the world saw everything learned a lot about people about brands um but ultimately when i, I sold up just uh, three years ago now it's over three years ago and i was ready to have a break um you know i was pretty burnt out by that stage you know on the road 200 days plus a year um you know and so it was it was a good chance to have a good break so did you at, th at that point of selling did you anticipate that was going to happen because you know, everybody's seen it. You've probably seen it a million times with, with other brands where when a big board gets involved and obviously when you you sell to a larger entity, a lot of that that sort of passion and that those individuals within a business that that kind of drive the innovation, drive the the, the processes and, 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 and keep it what it is, you kind of lose hold on you because you don't have any choice but to let go of certain things and, and, and facilitate yeah. growth, right? Yeah. You know, when you're trying to scale a business, did you, did you anticipate that that was actually going to happen when, when that first sale went about? I was warned, but I probably didn't, probably didn't believe it would be the way that it was. And, and I under, I understand, like we were very much at that, like we never, ever wrote a business plan. We never had any sales targets. We, we just wanted to make really great products. And I mean, you know, even right now I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, a capital raise for my new brand, which we never did really two times you. And, and I'm having to write down targets for the next six, seven years. Who knows? You, I mean, <laughs> you're, you're putting numbers in the sky. And, and so we're like, you know what? Let's, let's just make great products. Look, look at what sports opportunities exist and let's just go after them. And so we very much were, by the set of our pants, yes, we were, I mean, even when we were doing hundred million plus, we were, you know, you know, our business was structured enough, but, but, but you know, being a founder, I, I could just say, do it, do it, do it. But when we we got investors on board, everything got microanalyzed and everything just stopped. The innovation stopped, everything got over scrutinized and analyzed, and it just became a really hard place to work. I understand that you want to be more processed, but it got to the point where it just got, got heavily processed. And I think, you know, the guy came from Adidas and he came with systems and processes. But that was set up for a company worth billions of dollars, not for a company like of our yeah. size. And, and a part of our thing was our, our flexibility, our, our quickness to market, our um, you know, being disruptive and do, do it with being, you know, doing it in multiple ways. But when you become this big, slow moving ship, it just lost that energy. And, and people just, the, the energy of the brand, of the workplace just lost that, that spark, you know, energy, you know, when, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm a passionate guy, and and um and it just and I think it lost me because I it just I, I lost my passion because it just got too hard. Um, but you know, we decided to sell down. It was our decision. Um, you know, um, and so these things happen. And now I am in a place where I never really want to lose control ever again. I mean, I want to be in a place where I can maintain control because I think ultimately, um pretty good idea of what i'm doing now if the right people are on board with me and there's some areas i know nothing about like social media i'm an old fella but when it comes to building really good products i i've got a good idea what the customers are looking for you know so yeah yeah no you can you can you can see that person that's why i asked that question because i was like look was there any anticipation that that was going to happen because you know you do you lose agility you know brands want to increase the number of SKUs they are by you know million fold and obviously with someone coming from a brand like Adidas, who, who has, you know, in every category possible, right? You know, everything from high fashion to, to right down to collaborations and, you know, everything. So it was, uh, you know, it was interesting to, to hear your take on that as to whether you, and, and you said, yes, I was warned. But uh, I think I think you always live in hope, don't you, that, that, that you're going to maintain that 
agility and that ability to be able to, you know, innovate at the same, same speed, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And it's so, I think it's so vital. I mean, one thing I love about my new brand is that we, um, we discovered this new biodegradable fabric, which was a really amazing fabric. And normally it takes up to two years to get a fabric and bring it to market. We brought it to market in six weeks wow. uh, and we, we sell it in Harrods and Suffrages here in the UK and we, six weeks, that's what we can do now. We can be so quick and agile. Um, so anything new that comes out, we are on it so quickly um, that we can be a year of everyone else. And so like, it's just, I love it. I love just being that, that, that agile person that can take those shortcuts a little bit you know um and it, it just it just makes it more because i i used to hate bringing a collection out it would come out in two years time and then i'd find something new and go oh man it's gonna take two and a half years to get this out it's just really it was so frustrating but now yeah. i'm like stuff it. i'm i'm gonna change I'm, I'm gonna change this or change that and just do it you know and i i just love i love being that way you know and um and it's it's it makes it a lot more fun than the old regulatory way of taking two years to bring product to markets I bet, I bet they loved you when you were a hundred billion dollar brand and, uh, and and you're saying, yeah, we've just ordered X amount of units, but, but I'm going to change this now. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. So sure that yeah, went yeah. down really well, but it so went really well, but you know, but, but one thing I will say when you, when you have done it for that long, you learn to understand what you, what the customers would or wouldn't notice and only do it if the customer generally would really notice the difference, you know? And I think that's part of the expert. I see so many young guys come in, and start bike brands. I mean, having a bike brand seems to be in thing right now because it's not that hard to find a factory to make bike gear and you get fabric by the roll. Yeah. And but I, I look at them and going, you just don't you you don't have all those twenty plus years of veterans like me who know what customers do or don't notice. Or and I just set them waste so much money on things that the customers don't even care about. And I think that's part of the the thing of experience is that you under genuinely understand what's really important. Um, but also what the customers really want, you know, to understand what they think, you know, and, what, and whenever I make a new product now, I'm always thinking in my head, you know, would I use this product, you know, or would my customer base, is it relevant to them, you know, and um, yeah, I've uh, made plenty of mistakes over the years, but, you know, it's, um, it's I'm, st I'm still making a lot of mistakes today too, um, but um, a lot less than I used to anyway. Part of the journey though, right? Yeah, it is, exactly. So, so I, I think it'd be rude not to, to, to sort of delve into the science and delve into the, maybe not so much on the fabric side of things, because I think that would be lost. I think a lot of people just wouldn't get the, the, the concepts around there. I'm sure there's many of them that you can kind of simplify. So anything that we can sort of simplify and, and put out there, but compression garments. And again, uh, this is just my own interpretation here is that compression garments to me seem to come from, you know, what was probably originally things like rash vests and, uh, and running tights, you know, kind of back in the day, the Ron Hills and, you know, and it, it was just basically, it was tighter fabric that, that sort of clung to your skin and, and facilitated a little bit of a movement. Rash guards were there for, for what they were there for. And then they transitioned into sort of martial arts. So, so BJJ practitioners, you know, people would wear them underneath their geese and things like this. And then that became compression to people. So people saw compression as kind of something which had a bit of, Lycra spandex. I can never remember which one's the brand name or which one's the, you know, it's like the Hoover and vacuum cleaner thing, but <laughs> whichever one had spandex or Lycra or it, it was just basically a close fitting garment. Right. Yeah. And there's a, yeah. there's a hell of a lot more to it than that, isn't there? And, and yeah. you know, you still see it to this day. You know, I know that, the, you know, I go into a store and I'll see, you know, the big brands, the Nikes, the Adidas, and fundamentally they're just, they're just tight fitting a yeah. little bit of a spandex or Lycra mix in there. Uh, a little bit of cotton, and and that's about as far as the the, the technical side of the, the garment goes. You know, they might yeah. have high waist or whatever it might be, but typically it's just a fit thing. So, so tell us a bit about the science, and tell us a bit about the, the yeah. garments, the yarns, the the fabric, the fascial lines, and things like this. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, it's probably been probably been one of my biggest frustrations in life is brands calling compression compression. Or, or calling tights compression when they're clearly not compressive tights. And I think that's, you know, so many brands, particularly, I mean, obviously the first brand was a brand called Skins out of Australia. We were probably were the next real big one that, that, that came along. Skins was definitely more of a marketing company. We're more of a fabric company. And we were a lot, our fabric was a lot, a lot more, a lot better, more, more powerful, lighter weight. But ultimately now what, what that happened is that all these brands jumped on the marketplace and started to, 
buy a swimwear, like a rash vest fabric, yep. put into a pair of tights and say that's compression, when really it was not achieving the amount of power that it needed to, to be called compression. And there was no regulatory um, organization which which stops people using that word, which is which is unfortunate, um, you know, and and really there's a rating called an MM, MMHG rating, which basically rates the amount of power against the skin. And obviously compression originally came, from, came out of the hospitals, compression socks were worn. Um, you know, you really need to be getting 20 plus MMHG, even 30 plus MMHG to be getting really good increased blood flow. Um, and really a lot of brands nowadays, their tights might even hit 12 probably half what they need to hit. So be wary of the word compression, um, unless it is one of only a couple of brands actually out there. Um, you know, two times you is still one that I would put up there as being, you know, along with us would probably be in the top two brands that are doing compression clothing. Um, there's even some other brands start with C out there, a UK brand, which, yeah, I, would, I, don't, I wouldn't rate them too much, but you need to be really, really careful of what you call compression. One, because if, you, if, you, if you're using a compression fit, which is very, very, very powerful, and it's not been made properly, it can actually cause you more harm than good. You can actually get a, a, a negative blood flow, which can cause blood pooling and cause, cause DVT. So it's a really important thing for brands need to do their homework when it comes to compression. So that's the thing there. With compression for sport, and I'll say for sport because compression needs to be flexible, wearable, more, have good, good moisture management, comfortable to wear when you're doing sport. Basically, you want to make a fabric which is lightweight but still powerful. And that normally goes against the grain because normally the heavier you go, the more powerful it is. But it also must be flexible enough as well. So at two times you to start with, we really found, I think found a fabric that had good power that was still really, really good lightweight. And that was the, and we made that fabric by tinkering with circular knit machines, by doing things called drafting, we get more power, less weight, but I won't go into too much science behind it. Basically, we, we got a fact which was very, very powerful, that was still lightweight and still very breathable. And that really was, was what set us apart from our, our big competitors. And really compression back in the early days, the first brands brought it out to increase blood flow. So, so, so the same as the hospitals, you have surgery, you put on compression socks, you increase blood flow, you flush out all the waste products from surgery or sport and sports sense. Yep. So the next day, your legs feel refreshed, more energized. So recovery, graduated compression was really the start of what it, of what it, of where it started from. But then over the years, we discovered so many more things. Firstly, with compression clothing, it helped help the muscles not oscillate or shake as much. So basically, the the more you run, the more your muscles shake. It can cause micro tears, which causes bleeding, which causes swelling, which causes um, lo longer recovery, muscle soreness. Um, so by wearing compression, you stop the oscillation you, or, or you minimize the oscillation. So you had less muscle damage, less soreness, faster recovery. Plus, you also discovered that with the less excess shaking of the muscles, the less chance there was of getting these long-term overuse injuries as well. So we have all this documented in white papers and we did it two times G. So increased blood flow, flushed out products, refreshed your legs, less muscle damage, less muscle swelling, less muscle shaking for less these overuse injuries. We also discovered that when your muscles shake, it causes fatigue. So there's been studies done in a marathon where you on average run six minutes faster over a marathon because your muscles are not as fatigued from the muscle shaking as much. Plus we also discovered that that if you're lifting weights or doing power lifting, the compression holds your muscles in place to give you a much faster muscle reaction time so you can dead you can, so you can deadlift better. So for example, now in weightlifting, compression on the legs is really, really big because it actually helps cock your muscles for much more, much quicker muscle um, power, firing of power. So this, you know, there's so many, and obviously DVT flying on planes there's so many factors that compression actually work and i think when you look at compression research there's so many studies that say it doesn't work because those have been done and compression doesn't actually work every study we did at two times you for example we did a seven or eight big studies everyone had beyond a margin of error a really positive effect 
even even all the studies we did, we saw a lowering of heart rate. Like we don't, but don't, but it was always within a margin of error, so we never documented that. But there's so many things that with true compression actually helps athletes. And I'm still to this day amazed that more athletes don't use compression when they're actually working out, whether it be crossfitting, running, um, you know, any endurance sport, trail running, um, you know, powerlifting. It just goes without saying now, with the if you read the right research, that definitely helps. It should, it should have been, it should have been the the biggest find in sportswear in the last 20 or 30 years. However, the problem we face is too many brands bring out compression garments that aren't compression and the athletes then say compression doesn't work. It does work. I know without a fact that it works. So there's my little spell on compression. But honestly, there's so many, there's so many attributes to compression, old age people, people with diabetes, um, you know, um, women that are pregnant. Um, there's so many massive opportunities that still lie within the compression industry. So in some ways, when I started my new brand, even though my new brand, I, I would say it's really a run brand. We do compression as well, equally, equally. But, you know, you know, um, we, we didn't want to call it a compression because so many people think of compression poorly because they've used bad compression in the past and haven't used good compression. If you've used in the past, if you've used two times your compression in the past, and you don't, you don't think that it actually works. I've never found anybody who said that. So again, if you're using the right compression, and again, with my new brand, we've, we've taken what two times you fabric they use nowadays is like 12, 15 years old. What I did at Prezio, I basically raised the bar, more, more power, um, more power, more consistent power, um more eco-friendly as well which is a really really important thing what we're doing at prezio um but who, whoever's worn ours and two times you have now have all said ours has definitely has more power um for sure so you know i think we, we've definitely raised the bar again yeah i j- just to to add into that uh i have a medical uh issue with with one of my legs i i, I have uh, vascular insufficiency on one of my legs. So I've had an ongoing problem for about the last 10 years that I actually wear medical grade compression for. Now, uh, I actually got some of your socks not so long ago and, and they actually do pretty much exactly what the compression I get from the hospital does. So so they, they're much comfier, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're easier to get on because the ones from the hospital, are, you know, it's like you have to get a crowbar to actually get the damn things on. But it's, uh, yeah. but yeah, it, I mean, I'm a, I'll always be a fan of compression for for the fact that, that medically it helps me on a day to day basis. Uh, throughout my entire powerlifting career, I wore compression. Maybe yeah. not right up there with science. I used to wear skins, and I used yeah. to wear uh, BSC, uh, yeah. which I think was another Australian brand. I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And, and 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 I wore it throughout my powerlifting career because it was it was something that. I'd kind of done the research on, and obviously as a as a powerlifter, you'd mentioned powerlifting there and weightlifting. Uh, you know the the compression and the the, the fabric, uh, the power that you can get from fabric was obviously fairly, yeah, fairly evident because you know equipped powerlifters were using you know heavyweight canvas that they were stretching across their chests, and you know you go yeah, down yeah, into yeah. a squat and you have to use a certain amount of weight to actually stretch the fabric. And yeah. then the, so when you're referring to power, you're referring to and and again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but you're referring to the the fabric's ability to to sort of stretch and then contract essentially, aren't you? Yeah, it is. I mean, absolutely. And and, and just to say no before, spandex is the generic term, and lycra is is the brand name. Okay. I always get um, confused. Yeah, yeah right. and and lycra, lycra, the lycra is still the standout when it comes to the power. And I think one of the big things, you know, I've there's multiple brands: Royka, Hoyasung, Lycra is by the best one out there. But a, a big part of really good compression fabric is actually it, it's got to be comfortable to wear, but also it must come back and provide good power. And obviously, and the lycra, the lycra yarn we use, there's different brands, different types of lycra that we used, um, different formulations. It does have that that, const, that construction that comes back very, very strong. And it does it wear after wear after year. And it's another big issue with most compression out there. You might wear it one or two times, but then after three or four times, it starts to lose its power. And that's one of the really big things that we've developed at Prezio also at two times you was that we had very long lasting tights. They would the compel would be there 
wash after wash after wash and and having that power be consistent and be at a high level for a long time was really important and some of the, the lycra that we used up to 200 hours of use it would, it would lose maybe three percent of power where with some of the other brands of like of, 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 of spandex you would lose it after 20, 10, 20 hours of use so it would last 10 times more so it's all the science that, that I learned over the, obviously when I started Prezio, it's all the stuff I put into the new brand over 20 years of research. And, um, and not many people out there generally know how to set up a knitting machine to give you that power, that comeback power that will give you good power, but also not be too hard to get on, you know, and, yeah. and, and you can have that happen. And for example, even with your compression sock story, I mean, our, our compression socks are actually made in a medical compression facility. Um, but I can tell you now the cost of our socks would cost 10 times more to make than a, than a medical sock. Um, but yeah, the medical sock probably cost you two or three times more than what else us to buy. It goes <laughs> yeah, to I, so, I can attest so, to that. So, yeah. yeah. So, so honestly, our, the science we have in our socks, the yarns that we use are way above what they use in hospitals. I mean, they can, basically make a pair of compression socks for 60 or 80 cents in a factory and probably charge $200 for it. Where ours cost yeah. 10 times that amount to make our compression socks because we use really high quality yarns, you know, um, and comfort yarns, as you say. So don't, don't, people always come to me and go, oh yeah, um, did this brand, there's one brand in the market right now in the UK and they say, oh yeah, ours is medical compression. And I, I actually wrote to them the other day saying, oh, can you define what medical compression actually means? It doesn't mean anything. The word medical compression doesn't mean anything. I mean, there's no generic term called medical compression. So just trying to fool the customer by saying, yeah. because, you put the, because you put the word medical in there, people think that's more specific. No, there's no such thing as medical compression. There is cl there's class one, two, three, and four. And depending upon who you are, what class you invest into. But there's so many people. It's like now with my new brand being in a sustainable space. We are so sustainable. Everything that we do, you know, of course our packaging is sustainable and biodegradable. Of course our swing tags, our fabrics are all recycled. We use, we use particular dyes that, that, that we, we use no dye, but yet some brands use sustainability on their packaging and they're not sustainable hardly at all. And again, it's the same thing, same thing with, um, with compression. It's just using the words medical and like brands use sustainable now. Um, you know, it's, it really... It's frustrating for brands like ours that we actually do spend a lot more making a better product, um, whether it be with compression or whether it be sustainable in our, in our fabrics that we actually use. But other companies are, are telling half truths and getting away with it, you know. And so then, like, I'm a big advocate within compression to get a, a regulatory body on place where they can actually determine what is compression. And same in the sustainability place. And I know this is happening, a watchdog to really watch out for those companies that are greenwashing because greenwashing in this in, in this in our industry is just beyond it's just it's just not fair for the there's some brands out there you know like um nudie jeans patagonia who are doing are doing a great job um you know along with ourselves and it's just not fair i'm i'm probably paying 30 percent more for my products yeah to make it sustainable like yeah and i'm and i'm not actually charging any more for it i'm wearing that margin myself and um so it's those things and those smoking mirrors that brands play with that are, that are frustrating. Um, but hopefully in the end, the customer will wear it, feel it, then hopefully fall in love with it. And then we've got a brand advocate for life, which obviously is our, is our dream. So I think that's just, the, you know, you just need a, a product that does what it says on the tin, essentially. No, it's, uh, yeah. you know, but, but again, is there, is there that physical awareness of people when they put on a, a pair of, you know, bog standard compression, tights that they bought from wherever and they put them on and then there's this placebo impact for the first few times they use them and after that they kind of forget they're wearing them and you yeah. know they might throw them on now and again or they might not depend on whether they're doing leg day or whatever it, whatever yeah. it might be and yeah. then and then there's the actual i am putting these on for a performance purpose because they actually give me a performance edge and they give me you know a benefit there and i i think it's challenging i think the space you're in because I think a lot of people don't have that body awareness to to know when something's actually benefit them because we're we're talking fairly small margins here, aren't we? You know, it's not the sort of thing that you're going to put it on, and then all of a sudden you're you're knocking out PBs and you you wear faster and this that the other. This is this is something that 
you know, training wise, you're going to be able to train harder for longer, you're going to recover better, you're going to have better blood flow. You've got all of these benefits that then cumulatively, when you, you stack them all up, and this is a lot of the stuff we talk about, is that it's those little things that you consistently do that will ultimately yeah. end up with with a, yeah. a heightened performance, and especially in elite, elite levels. And, it, you know, it's a term you've yeah. used several times is that in elite sport, those things make a massive difference, right? Yeah. Oh, no, I agree. And, and, and I, would, I would even challenge you and say, it, it isn't just, there's it, actually good percentages of, 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 I mean, particularly even with powerlifting, like, you know, some of the numbers we're getting out of guys who are wearing powerful compression versus nothing at all. There was some significant differences in what, in what weights they were pushing, for example. I mean, definitely with injuries as well. And I, I can't run with that compression on, but one of the amazing things I find for, uh, for 100, 100 pounds, 100 quid, as you guys would say here in the UK, you can buy a piece of equipment that will generally help you during and after you work out. Like I know so many of my mates have, have gone out. I mean, I, I've got some too, because I went, I mean, I've got some, you know, um, Norma Tech boots. I mean, um, my mate last week went out and bought the, the new ice, the new ice boots, yep. which, and I use those very, very, very cool. But I honestly, for 4,000 versus a hundred pounds, compression is the best value thing you can get to recover in and to work out in it really it should be in everybody's wardrobe good compression should be in their wardrobe um you know it should just be a complete complete go-to um you know um thing and you know i mean even i mean i you know you know we um you know we we have recently been we're supplying a few premier league um premiership rugby clubs to is we have the Exeter Chiefs and we, we've been dealing with the um, Ealing Trail Finders who hopes you'll be in the Premiership next year. And honestly, just, just their feedback on what they used to use and what they use with us has been so dramatic that I think there definitely is more than just placebo. There definitely is a real essence of, um, of we're in. And I think, you know, and definitely with our, our compression, even if you are a two times you use it in the past and you put Prezio on, you will put it on and you'll go, wow, this is next level. You know, and we we always gonna be careful not to be too much too powerful, but these are definitely got a hell of a lot more power. And particularly if you even are a little bit older, for example, and you are in your forties, fifties, and you do get niggles and little bits of injuries here and there, it, it it's probably less than a physio visit to get a pair of compression. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And you know, and it's it it's worth the it's worth a try, one hundred percent. You know, um, you know. Right. So I'm gonna be a little bit contentious here. Yeah. So, so where does this sit? Because because I'm going back to I'm trying to think which Olympics when Speedo brought out their their suit, their shark fin suit, yeah. suit yeah. shark fin soup. I nearly said that yeah. their shark fin suit, and it was the it had the the, the material that was the, the yeah. they said resembled shark skin or yeah. you know whatever tech. Yeah. And obviously, when you start to get into those realms, you start to get into almost performance enhancement, right? Yeah. So. Is this going to get that good that people are, and, and and we've got the Nike, the the vapor fly, isn't it? Is it yeah. the vapor fly? The vapor yeah. fly where where there was this big thing about every single runner, they're they're, they're smashing records, they're smashing this, that, the other, because they've got these carbon fiber midsoles and blah yeah, blah blah, sure. and their sprint shoes. And so are they breathing down your neck at the moment and going, is this edging on performance enhancement? Is this something where they're going to clamp down and say, look? Athletes aren't going to be allowed to use Presio because it's too good. It does too much. It, it assists way too much. It's a performance advantage that not every competitor is going to have. Do you ever yeah. think there's going to be a, a, a place where that um, comes from? I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, I know. I already already know that that, that UCI and UCI and cycling bans the use of compression um, because it benefits there. I think because ultimately the the benefits of injury prevention. Um, of of being able to recover better all those attributes are there enhancement of performance maybe in some sports maybe they will start to limit the amount of power that's in compression and they and they may they may do that because it might have a spring a spring effect um so that that may happen but i think ultimately compression in the moment most of the research that's white papered is definitely coming through and enhanced recovery it's coming through in um, less muscle injuries faster recovery yep. um, the actual studies that are, that are performance enhancing they're definitely up there and they're definitely showing positive signs 
but there's probably not enough of an uproar on it yet. Because um, compression can still go tighter. It can still go much more powerful. But to, for the average consumer, you've got to limit it a little bit because the consumer will get scared away if it's too hard, too hard to put on. Um, so you're always trying to straddle that. So look, who, who knows? I mean, I know in cycling it's been banned. Other sports, it may be banned. Um, the, the funny story you mentioned about the whole shark skin is quite interesting because the, the shark skin pattern actually made the swimmers go slower. Um, about, about three or four years later, Speedo figured out just having a smooth surface with Teflon coating was faster than the actual shark skin okay, design. Right. Unless, you were going, unless you were going 30 seconds per hundred meters, obviously sharks go much faster than humans do. Yeah, of course. Anything above 30 seconds per hundred meters, which no swimmer could ever swim at, it was slower than just smooth fabric. So again, th- th- there was a little bit of a story that people actually know about, um, but, um, but the, just a smooth surface. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, possibly, but I think they will just bring in regulatory things. I think that the carbon plates and shoes is probably more of a speed factor than a injury factor. You know, so yeah, yeah. yeah, it probably causes injuries, to be honest. So. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're largely talking about, you know, the, the, the training period, right? Aren't you? you? You're wearing things that assist you in training, allow you to recover faster, allow you to train more, uh, allow you to train, you know, with less risk of injury. You've got increased circulation, which again, you know, uh, getting rid of waste products and, you know, uh, byproducts of training. Uh, so you've got all of these factors in there and, and really a nod to uh, the, you know, the validity of this is that when when you've got certain federations that are starting to ban these things, you know full well that it works, right? Yeah. You know, they're not going to turn around and say, well, you can't wear compression because because it doesn't actually work. Yeah. You know, compression clearly does work because they're going, you know, not so much. So it's uh it's it's fascinating. So so how does it work with I read read a bunch of stuff quite some years ago actually about the the kind of fascial lines and the way that the fabric is, you know, the weave of the fabric goes with the muscle and how the muscle contracts. And it, is that all still something you do or is that something that was kind of dismissed or oh look, look we we definitely um follow the trend i mean i mean pretty much what you've got to do with compression particularly graduated compression the main the main facet around it is just ensuring that the grade that the graduation is going to be going the highest number to to at the bottom to so the highest energy to the lowest at the top to make sure the, the blood flow is actually increased. I think the fabrics we use nowadays have enough pliability and flexibility that things like fashion and kind of stuff, it's it's not it's not going to be a huge issue. Um, you know, I mean, obviously things like seam lines are really important. Um, things like um, um, where you apply certain amounts of pressure can be really important as well. Um, yeah. And some of our products, we've had to take away some of the power pressure points on some of the calf muscles, for example, in particular areas because it can become irritating, um, you know. So, but on, on a whole, I think the graduation aspect is the most important part. And things yep. like seam lines, where you do and don't put particular power print, like in our top print tights, we have call a power print, which doubles the amount of power of what a tight normally has. And we only recommend that for real power lifters, real high intensity athletes. But really we've had, we've had no real complaints at all calf muscles or quads on those. Yeah, I, I need to. I need to ask you something. It's a personal question, actually. Here, the uh, the paneling that you're talking about there, does it rub off with a barbell? <laughs> with, with a barbell, ah, uh, it actually good point on that. And then it probably it it actually doesn't. Like we've, I've now had a pair of our print now for. T- I've washed it every day for two years, and it yeah. still looks like new. It mm-hmm. it is a little bit it is a little bit sticky. I was, so I was worried may... the other day. I, I I I was just about to. I'd, I'd put my tights on, and then I'm like, oh, I'm deadlifting. And then I was really worried, and, and I actually put a pair of shorts over the top, so okay. so it wouldn't catch it because I was because I didn't know, and I was I was worried yeah. that it was actually going to drag that off the actual. Uh... No, no, no. That our that print is bomb proof. It, it's actually six layers of a silicon print. It is bomb proof. If you can get it off, I'll <laughs> give it a copy a new pair. Trust me. And, and the listeners out there, it's um indestructible that print. Which yeah. Is, which no, that, no, that was because I, I felt it and I thought. You know, if the bar catches that, that's gonna that's gonna pull that, and and they they, they looked they were brand new out of the packet and they looked so nice. And I might all right, I'm gonna check with you on that one. So, yeah. so but yeah. no, they were fantastic. I was I was really impressed by them. And, and again, it's you know it's stuff that I've used before. So, so that migration. So all of this knowledge, all of this evidence, all of this data, and I think you know, 
I think it was something like 70, 70 to eighty percent of all the data is is positive when it comes to compression. And obviously, you you kind of dismissed a few of the studies there because obviously, you know, with with any kind of sports science, there's studies that are done with the wrong, you know, you're going to get a negative output because you've yeah. used the wrong input. You know, you're using poor quality compression. Yeah. And, yeah. and the outcome is only going to be one thing, which is, you know, it's negative. It doesn't do what it's meant to do or it doesn't do what it claims to do. So, so you've got to kind yeah, of dismiss yeah. them. So, you know, 70 to 80% of studies, and again, correct me if I'm wrong there, but I think it's something like 70 or 80% of all studies that have been done on compression have shown that it, it has a positive effect. You know, uh, I think you did one where, where it lowered heart rate, uh, increased blood flow, which again is, you know, what we've been talking about and, and improves endurance, which again is another thing we've been talking about. Yeah. 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 For sure. I mean, I'll give you one example. We once got approached by um, a German university. They did two previous studies on compression and both in both studies were with brands. I know of relatively well, kind of more local German brands, both came back, not showing any improvements. And they did, they did a study using our compression and showed dramatic improvements in the results. So again, it's just, you know what? So many brands just go out and buy a pair of swimwear fabric yep. and make it into a pair of tights. And, and, and this is, and 70, 80%, I would say, you know, again, every study that I've ever done at two times, you know, again, we, we, it was always done through the AIS, which was a government institution they said we cannot in any way legally favor because we've come under the under Australian sports commission. We cannot favor anything in any way towards it being a positive outcome. We've got to do this scientifically and properly. And we're like, of course you do that. The results on every test we did were beyond always beyond our wildest dreams. Like, you know, like again, the lowering of heart rates It's like, who would have guessed that we did another study six years later yeah. and we discovered a lowering of heart rate. Then and we went back to the, previous and go ah oh, now that makes sense because we we, we, we did some algorithms that we worked out ah so that means lower so it means lower that, that, that then means uh better lactate lactose threshold because you're operating the lower heart rate at the same speed so you're actually getting lower lower threshold yeah it's just been increased with exertion so there's all these things that are coming out and recovery endurance less muscle injuries is really hard to do because you have to get do biopsies is quite intrusive, but we are currently doing some of those at Prezio. Um, we have La Trobe University in Australia. Matt Driller, who did all the studies at the AAS, he's now on board with us. And so we're working with La Trobe University in Melbourne, um, doing some studies on, on muscle bi with muscle biopsies and stuff like that too. So really getting into the real, mu the real muscular, um, look at the real muscular metrics of muscle damage as well. Um, because I honestly, to you and to the viewers out there, I'm not, I generally, I've been wearing compression now for 20 years. It without a doubt works. If I don't wear my compression when I go running for two or three days, I get a sore calf. I get sore calves, you know, and, and if I come back from an injury, I might wear calf guards and socks together. And then I'll go down just a sock because it just helps support the muscle so much better. So, I mean, I've been playing with this for so many years. Um, and it, it really generally really works. Um, you know, so it's, uh, you know, and I think, I think the science is there. I think if you looked at the studies, what brands, if you look at the, if, if skins was in it, if two times you was in it, when we do our studies and the top brands were in it, normally the results are pretty positive. You look at the other studies, normally local brands, they, they won't be mentioning MMHG levels. The tights won't be graduated. There's all these aspects you'll look into um, that you're probably pretty easy to find. And look, some studies may come back because they're, they're testing the wrong thing. You know, maybe there's some things that compression yeah. on some people, we notice different results with things like your blood pressure, your MMH and blood pressure can be different um, to depend on, how, on what, depending on what your blood pressure is. I mean, all, a lot of things come into play. How fit you are, how un, actually the more unfit you are, the better results we actually found. I mean, there's all these things come into play. So, you know, a lot of different different body shapes and it's out there as well. So Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'd, a, I'd attest to it. I mean, I, I dug into the science on, on these probably 10 or 12 years ago when when it was probably in its infancy with respect to the amount of papers and things. And, and just, you've actually sparked my interest up again. I've, I've actually been digging into a bunch of the research over the last couple of weeks before, obviously we, we, we've had this conversation and, 
and and it, it's amazing some of the data that's out there. So and what we'll do on the at the end of this podcast is we'll actually tag uh, some of the data there for anybody who wants to to go away and read anymore. We'll we'll put some of that in. So if you've got any studies. Uh, I'll grab them from you as well, and we can yeah. we can chuck all them in together, which would be great for any of the listeners to to have a read through for those who are that way inclined and want to yeah. want to really dig into that stuff. So, so tell me a bit more about Pressio. So, so what are the plans with Pressio? So you said we're not a compression brand, we're a we're a running brand. So, yeah. so explain to me how that's going. And well, and I mean, I, I mean, I, don't, I mean, like, I, I don't want to be labelled as a compression brand. I think when you when you start a new company. I find, that little, I find that a little sad, Jamie. I find that a little <laughs> sad that, that uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, the industry that I came from is that there's that reluctance to actually name your, your brand, what it is, or your, your business, what it is, because it, that, that term has been so poorly used in the, in the past. Yeah. I actually find that quite sad, but, yeah. but I, I, I get the business. Well, no, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll put it to him and I would say, you know, we are, we're generally, you know, we are a sports fair company and, 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 and we've, we've decided that, in our first years that the run market and compression market are the two areas that we, that we actually want to go after. Um, you know, primarily because, um, you know, we still believe that the running market for me personally, I, even though I'm an ex pro triathlete running was, wasn't the best thing on, on the, on the I2 circuit. I was the best runner for many years. You know, I, you know, I, you know, I've run 28, high 28 for 10k it's what i it's what i've always loved uh and so and i wanted to create a really amazing run brand compression i know it so well that it's like i've got to do compression as well i've got to do run and do compression because they're too and the run market too you know there's not really a lot of brands doing really amazing run gear i mean there's i mean if you look at cycling there's so many cool cycle brands there's the 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 maps obviously the, the raffer of the past um, there's the maps, the attacker. There's so many cool, you know, in NAS and you know um, studios and all these brands out there. They're really cool brands. But in the run market, there's a obviously there's a brand called Saw here in the U- UK, which is doing okay, but again, super high price points. Um, but there's no real good alternative to wearing Nike or Adidas or Essex or New Balance run clothing. And so we wanted to create a great run brand and and to to make it harder in some ways i'm like you know i want to make the world's best moisture wicking fabrics possible but i also want to do it sustainably as well so i spent the two years in between two times you and prezio working with some of the world's biggest um recycled yarn supplies one called unify which is based in north carolina in the u.s making next level um recycled polyester yarns that wicked moisture better than what virgin yarns did so what, I, what i've created is a running brand that the moisture management is next level you know the fabrics the, the highly ventilated a lot of bonding on the seams they look they look slick they look cool it's a cool brand but it, as far as a runner goes it will give you the best moisture management the best comfort you're ever going to find but it's also heavily sustainable as well it isn't just packaging or swing ticket it is the fabric's 100 recycled um, a lot of our fabrics are also solution dyed, so they're actually not going through the big dye, dye batch. Our compression, so you know, has no dyes in them at all. It's purely done through, and it's through done through. Uh, we actually color the chip before the yarn gets extruded, so it never goes into the big dyeing process. So we have 80 per, 85% less chemicals in our tights. We use 90% less energy to actually make them, um, and 85% less CO2 emissions. To make our oh. tights versus it. So we are, and actually, even with our compression, for example, by doing the non-dye, we're getting much more power because the dyeing process actually takes away some of the power of compression tights because it goes through this really hot wash. So by being sustainable, we're actually making a better product as well, which makes it even cooler, you know. So so our compression is sustainable, our run gear, there's no brand on the planet in sportswear right now that's doing what we're doing in the sustainability play. There's not one brand. And I challenge anyone to find it. We, we're fully transparent. We're actually just saying to brands out there, hey, if you want to be more sustainable, look on our website. We'll tell you, everybody who's making our fabrics for us, you can use whatever we, we, we've already developed. Go and use it. If you want to help, I've said to them before, people, if you've got a sports, if you want help being sustainable, come and tell, ask me and I'll give you help how to do it. We, we want to transform the market where 
every race you do, you're given this horrible polyester virgin run t-shirt that you're never going to wear again. We want to give you, like even now we're doing events and we're giving run directors recycled run t-shirts. Our goal actually next year, we're going to an event next year, we're going to get the run bottles that have been thrown, thrown away on the run course. Yep. And we're going to repurpose those into run t-shirts the following year. Very cool. So, I mean, like, this is the stuff that we want to do. And honestly, there's no excuse anymore that run brands cannot have a sustainable play. The yarns are out there. If you want to be sustainable, you want to spend a little bit extra, you can make your sports gear sustainable. But brands, again, we're young, we're agile, we can do this kind of stuff. We don't have huge overheads. We're absorbing the margin. But I really hope people will go to a store. I mean, for example, our top run T-shirt, it's about 60 pounds, Italian fabrics, fully recycled, bonded seams. If you want to go and buy it from an, another brand that I mentioned to you earlier, it'll cost you 90 pounds and it's not even sustainable. So we are trying to be mass, mass consumer, sustainable with good price points. And with my background in sourcing fabrics and my supply base that I have, I can do that and still and still and still turn a small profit. So, you know, so that that's the reason why in year one on the UK market, you know, year one we've walked into Harrods, Suffages, even flannels, which is a high end, yep. you know, matches, far fetch. Next year we're in all the up and running stores. We're we're in, we're going to be in in our run and become next year. Um, we've turned down going into these into the big online retailers because we want to look after the the brick and mortar stores, you know. Yep. Um, but we are in these stores because we've got a great product that is fully sustainable, that is also price pointed well. Um, and that's my goal. I, mean, I don't I don't need to be making millions like I did two times a year. I can now make enough to survive um, and make to make a good profit, but do it in a sustainable way. And I'm I'm now on a I'm now on a mission. I really want to change the landscape of sports wear and run. And I, I know what I've done. So we're going to the US market next year. We've got some great retailers on board. We, 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 we're going through some fundraising right now. It's been very easy to find people to invest in our brand because yep. we, we are truly unique in the sportswear space of what we're doing. We're working on, we're actually working on right now, obviously right now, all synthetic fibers come from petroleum-based. We're working on bio-based yarns coming from plants that have still got amazing moisture management. Um, so we are really pushing the boundaries of where we're taking this in the future. So, you know, we, we want to own that space of being the world's most sustainable sportswear brand. And that's what we're after to do. So exciting. Yeah. It's amazing. And, and, yeah. and again, it, you know, I think, you know, like you said, it, it, it's challenging for the smaller brands, but certainly the bigger brands should be paying attention here. And, 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 you know, we going down that route because again, if they, they start, you know, you, you light the fire and obviously they, they keep it going and everybody starts doing this all of a sudden that, that, that sustainable play becomes more affordable. It becomes more accessible for smaller brands that do need to make better margins and things like this, which is, which is fantastic. You know, that, that, that you're able to do that with a, with, with what is now, a, you know, a small brand and, and hopefully in the future will be, a, will be a big brand as well. So, so yeah, yeah I mean, you know, it, it's incredible to see brands doing that because it is challenging. It is time consuming. It is, you know, it requires innovation. It requires funding. It requires all of that stuff. And it is challenging. So it's, you know, it's great to see. Yeah. So what's no, it, is, it is. No, it is challenging, but I think nowadays you have to be different. Yeah. Like if I came out and just started a whole new two times you, it'd be very hard to, to be successful. And I, I think you, if you want to do well in business, you've got to find a space in the market where you, where you can be unique. Otherwise it's just really hard. And, and for us, we're like, you know, we want to have a performance, but, but in the sustainability play, we almost, create our own market um, because yeah. no one has, has really done it properly, you know? And, um, and so look, so we, we've definitely found a really good niche. Um, and what's great, it's actually a good niche to be in because it's, it's, it's positive for the planet, you know? And I think the things that we're doing too in our research too, we know we can, we're going to be able to mass scale them in the future too, which is, which, which is great for the planet as well. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it's, it's very cool. And, and, and having those open channels, I mean, you know, that transparency there, because again, this is the sort of stuff that, that a lot of brands would be, well, I'm not telling you, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, facilitate that. I'm not going to tell you where we get stuff from. I'm not going to tell you how we do it. I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. And, and again, I think that transparency now in, in any big business or any small business is seen as a very, 
a very sort of noble thing to do and also the right thing to do. I mean, we, yeah. we are fully transparent about everything we do. Uh, we talk about ingredients. We talk about everything that we, you know, that we try and do with the brand. We've had a few challenges with, again, the sustainability player. We, you know, with packaging because, you know, we're entering areas that nobody's ever done. And nobody's ever done it for for the for the reason that it's challenging. You know, it's so easy for us to you know take our products and just stick them in a plastic tub like everybody else does. But yeah. but but we've tried not to do that because we do want to you know carve a niche out in that area and and do something that's that's better than better done than it was before. And, and you know, it costs yeah. us. It costs us a little bit more. It's you know, it's more challenging. We've we've had to go back to the drawing board several times, which I'm sure you have as well, yeah. uh, because because it didn't work the way that we wanted it to work, and and people have have done it before, but then they didn't progress it and didn't try and challenge it. So, you know, it's it, it's a great space to be in, and, and you know what I see with what you're doing with Pressio, uh, you know your, your history with it with two times you, it's you know it's a market like you said at the very start that that I think people haven't really got into. And I think there's a massive market now where people are looking at performance in a different light. And, you know, hence why we're having this conversation in many respects is that, that I came across your brand because of, of, you know, we're pursuing performance in human beings. We're looking at, you know, what are the things that people can do that are outside of the things that people have always done yeah. and, and, you know, trying to hit that slightly different market. So, you know, it, it's incredible to, to hear that story and hear how you, 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 you've came through that progression from, you know, working with Orca, which uh, Orca still exists, don't they? Yeah, it does. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's still around. It's um, it's and it, it's still making really good products. I mean, you know, my 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 very good friend, um, you know, back in the day, he's now he's he, he he's more hands off, but still still mainly just in triathlon. Um, but yes, but, but still kicking around. Yeah, I think I've, I've always associated Orca with wetsuits for some reason. I think. It was it was it was definitely more of a triathlon brand in Is the past. It? Um, I mean, yeah. we. We, we, we actually made the, the Olympic uniforms for New Zealand the yeah. third year I was there, which was a huge pro. I learned a lot doing that. But so it, it was more than just a triathlon brand in New Zealand, but really, really stayed a triathlon brand in the rest of the world. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And it, hey, look, uh, I've taken up a, a huge amount of your time. I'm sure you're a very busy man. Are you, are you in the office at the moment? Yes, I am. I, I just, it just came in. We just had a phone call with a customer in the US and then I spoke to you, but I'll be heading back home. I've got a nice... Nice New Zealand red waiting for me when I get home. Very nice, so. very nice. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure you probably clocked up some miles today. Have you somewhere along the line? Yeah, I, I did 17k run this morning with a, <laughs> just a, with a good friend of mine, Sam. So that uh, yeah, no, was good. Just a casual 17k this morning, and then uh, yeah, I'm sure that that red's very very well earned. So sure. well, thank you, Jamie. Thank you so much for your time and 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 taking us through compression because again, I, I think it's an area that that I I think I would have struggled to find someone who is. Uh, well, by any means, anywhere near as knowledgeable as you, but but somebody who could explain compression and you know the do's and don'ts, what to look for and what not look not to look for. But obviously, we've pointed at certainly two brands there that, that that you've been involved with, which I think is more than adequate for people to go at if they're serious about compression and using it for what it's what it's meant for. Uh, and obviously, Pressio. So Pressio is just Pressio.com, right? Yep, correct. Pressio.com. P R E S S I O. Yep. Cool. And we'll put all the links in there in the, in the bio below. And uh, if people want to get in touch with Presio, it just, is it info at Presio.com? Or just to Jamie at Presio, it'll come Jamie to me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Look at that. Look at yeah. that. You're going to get bombarded now. <laughs> no, that's <But> right. <laughs> it's all good. Well, thank you so much for your time once again. And uh, have a safe journey home and enjoy that red. Great. Thanks, Phil. Thanks great to speak, Jamie. You too. Take care. Yeah.